Hello and a warm welcome to this week's edition of Africa 360. My name is Kwango Liwewe. What does the new year hold in store for Africa? This week on Africa 360, we ask a panel of analysts to peek into their crystal balls. From conflict to terror, elections and the economy. Let's see what 2015 may hold for us. Well, joining me now from our Pretoria studios is Dr. Yaki Silias. He is the Executive Director of the Institute for Security Studies. Thank you very much for joining us here on 360, Dr. Silias. But before we go into our discussion, let's have a look at this short video to contextualize recent conflict patterns on the continent. For a decade after the end of the Cold War, the world experienced a dramatic decline in the incidence and deadliness of armed conflict, particularly in Africa. If we take population size into account, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East carry the largest conflict burden. Most of this violence occurs within and not between countries. Seven relationships explain the relatively high levels of internal armed conflict in Africa. The first is poverty. Internal armed violence is more frequent and poorer than in wealthier countries. More than one third of Africa's population still lives in extreme poverty. Poverty is exacerbated by inequality and inequality fuels violence. Transitions from autocracy to democracy or adverse regime changes are often prone to violence. A large democratic deficit translates into a risk of instability. In the Arab Spring countries, citizens' demand for democracy was vastly at odds with the actual supply. Africa's population is young. This is an advantage. But if young people lack opportunities and rates of urbanization are high, the risk of conflict increases. Once a country has experienced large-scale violence, the tendency towards repeat violence is strong. Being located in a conflict-ridden neighborhood increases the risk of experiencing instability. Rising global inequality and transnational terrorism add to the internal and regional drivers of conflict in Africa. Looking longer term, we also expect resource competition at a local level to trigger violence. Since 2010, violence in Africa has been on the rise. Contemporary African conflicts are increasingly fragmented, fought on a smaller scale and on the peripheries of states. More non-state actors are involved and insurgents are often divided. The spread of transnational organized crime, including terrorism, is often linked with local politics and criminal dynamics. Lower intensity conflict is becoming more prevalent and since 2011 there has been a rise in social conflict, especially anti-government violence. Violence related to elections has also increased. Strong democracies are generally associated with greater peace, but democratization can trigger violence in the short and medium term. Violence at a community level has also increased. People compete over scarce livelihood resources such as land and water. The impact of climate change will aggravate this trend. Most conflicts include elements of support from neighboring countries, as borders are not controlled and rural areas not policed. The generally positive development outlook for Africa presents an unprecedented opportunity to ensure greater peace. Africa is likely to grow at an average annual rate of around 6% over the next 15 years, and incomes will continue to rise. This will steadily chip away at the structural drivers of conflict. As national incomes increase, states have more resources to deter, stop, and prevent violence. Africans have an opportunity to shape their own future, but the quality and nature of governance is key. Poor governance, marginalization, Lack of voice and accountability cut across many of the current conflict dynamics in Africa. We need to focus on building security, capacity and inclusion at all levels in our societies. To make development, stability and peace a reality in Africa will require concerted effort at national, regional and continental levels as well as the support of the United Nations. Well, Dr. Silius, I mean, what we've seen now um, in terms of conflict in Africa, um, security is a problem when it comes to this. 2015, when we look at what we've gone through in 2014 in terms of South Sudan, Central Africa Republic, Eastern DRC, do we expect to see more conflict in these areas as we progress into the next year? 
I think in the short term the prognosis is, is not good, but it's important to emphasize, as that video also shows, that violence in Africa is concentrated in a number of key states, Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, Central African Republic, uh, Nigeria, and so on. While a large number of countries are relatively peaceful, um, the violence in these select five, six countries will determine how people generally perceive Africa. The broad trend is clear, and that is that over a long time horizon, violence decreases over time. But in the short term, you have these peaks and troughs. And at the moment, certainly, Africa is experiencing an increase in violence and instability. And what about um, influence from outside Africa, Western powers influence when it comes to conflicts on the continent? What's that looking like um, in your projection of 2015? Um, Africa is, uh, is cons uh, constituted of 55 relatively weak states. Because we, have, we, we are weak globally, uh, global impacts have quite an, an impact on the continent. In the years that led up to the fall of the Berlin Wall, we saw Africa, a conflict in Africa really increase dramatically and then fall off very sharply after 1989 when the Berlin Wall collapsed. And this demonstrates our vulnerability to external developments. And as uh, we see at the moment, uh, a degree of rise in global tensions, there is concern that this would have uh, an impact also on Africa. But the greatest fear is the extent to which we could see uh, global terrorism uh, play itself out in Africa. We have high levels of poverty, we have a deeply religious uh, uh, continent, and we have poor governance. And these factors mean that uh, terrorism can easily find root in Africa. And that, I think, is what concerns African governments and leaders most. Picking up on terrorism, of course, um, there's the threat of al-Shabaab in East Africa, Boko Haram in West Africa. And as we look to 2015, do we expect to see escalated attacks from these groups? I think we are going to experience an escalation in, in threats. And the reasons are that uh, these uh, groups, we've recently done a significant amount of work on what motivates uh, al-Shabaab in particular to participate uh, in terrorism. And what drives people are, are domestic conditions. It's not the global context. It's not some type of global jihad that's coming to Africa. It is locals that are deeply aggrieved by poor governance and the way in which they are treated, who become radicalized and then seize upon uh, other belief systems and, and justify their actions uh, through those belief systems. And unfortunately, that dynamic is not something you turn around. Well, do stay with us. Our discussion continues after the break. Don't go away. It may be a sobering start to the new year in Africa, with key challenges set to persist. On the political front, Zambia will hold a presidential by-election in January. It will be a closely watched poll after the death of President Michael Sata revealed deep divisions within the ruling Patriotic Front. The continent's most populous nation will also go to the polls. Good luck, Jonathan will seek a second term as president of Nigeria as the country continues to battle a punishing Boko Haram insurgency. Economically, Africa is set to maintain impressive growth figures in 2015. The World Bank projects 5.2% average growth, up from the current 4.6%. The bank warns, however, that growth may be hindered by the Ebola outbreak. According to the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, a worst-case scenario could see up to 1.4 million cases of the deadly disease by the end of January. Welcome back. You're watching Africa 360. We've spoken about conflict. Now let's discuss political trends that may shape 2015. Dr. Yaki Silias is still with us in our Pretoria studios and joining me in this conversation is Tiseke Kasambala from Human Rights Watch. Welcome, Tiseke. Now, earlier on, we were talking about um, terrorism. We ended um, the last segment on terrorism. And if we look at the issue in Kenya with al-Shabaab, um, the attacks um, Kenya invaded or more or less sent boots into Somalia almost three years ago. And we've seen a lot of Kenyans dying because of um, this conflict between al-Shabaab and the Kenyan government. Is it time for them to pull out their boots from Somalia? Um, I think the, the, the greatest issue here, and, and this, this issue has no, there's no signs that it should be going away anytime soon. Um, and the greatest issue here, is, I think um, uh, Dr. Celia has actually alluded to it, is the way the Kenyan government has reacted to the terrorism by al-Shabaab, in particular in Somali refugee camps and also um, in Kenya itself. 
um, one of our most recent reports at Human Rights Watch documents the enforced disappearances um, and extrajudicial killings of terrorism suspects in detention, um, in police detention with the Kenyan government of, of terrorism suspects. That's a big thing because what it does is it simply um, enables the cycle of violence to continue. You have a lot of disaffected Somali youth who've been living in Kenya for many, many years now who are swept off the streets as terrorism suspects, um, either tortured, um, disappeared, or um, extrajudicially killed. So the Kenyan government is not following, following the rule of law. There's a lot of human rights violations taking place. And that simply, I think, um, adds um, fuel to the flames. Dr. Silius, should Kenyan boots leave Somalia? Uh, no, they should not. Kenya has got a vested interest in uh, Somalia and uh, Kenyan stability in the medium long term will be uh, deeply affected by what happens in Somalia. I think another factor that's what, what, uh, what is happening is that as Amazon extends government control in Somalia, we see that Al-Shabaab uh, terrorists are uh, fleeing and they are also moving into, into Kenya. So uh, unfortunately, uh, what we're seeing in uh, some of the northern parts of Kenya also reflects in a sense the success in re-establishing authority in Somalia. Now, of course, there's a crucial election in Nigeria in February. And how do you see this playing between the elections and the insurgency? Once again, I think the problem has been in how the government in Nigeria has addressed the situation um, with Boko Haram. What happens when you, when you mistreat populations whom you suspect of being either contributing to Boko Haram what happens is you get a lot of disaffection within those communities. What we've seen um, is the Nigerian government, in particular the Nigerian army, going in, into communities in, in the north of Nigeria and disappearing young men. We've documented hundreds of young men who've been disappeared by the Nigerian government. That hasn't solved the situation with Boko Haram. It actually hasn't addressed the root causes of why Boko Haram continues to succeed and continues to commit atrocities in that, in, in that area. So one would hope that the Nigerian government would not be looking at this as an election issue and therefore seeking populist um, attempts to address the issue, but will actually be looking at how it can address the root causes of poverty and disaffection in the northern parts of, Uganda, uh, sorry, of Nigeria to address the situation um, and, and to stop Boko Haram. Now, in terms of uh, the political landscape um, with the election just around the corner, uh, Tuseka has just said they shouldn't use it as an election technique to win votes. Um, how, do you, how do you look at this? I, I think it is going to be a ch challenge. The, the situation in Nigeria is, is extremely volatile, partly because of the north-south issue. And, the, and Nigeria faces an additional problem, and that is the impact that the global reductions in oil revenues will have on it. Um, oil is now at $70, $70 a barrel, and Nigeria's budget was uh, done at a considerably higher level. This is going to reduce oil revenues to the Nigerian government and uh, reduce their ability to have the resources to combat uh, either Al-Shabaab, uh, uh, sorry, um, Boko Haram, or to deal with some of the governance issues. So I'm afraid that the situation in Nigeria probably just does not look very good. There is also the chance, of course, that uh, we may see a reduction in violence after the elections because there are some uh, that would argue that the uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria is intimately linked to the domestic political issues. And then once the presidency is behind us, the elections are behind us, we may see that some of these motivations may go, uh, go away. Uh, that hopefully is a, a more positive prognosis. Let's look at other parts of the continent. Um, when we talk about succession debates, there's Zambia to talk about, there's Zimbabwe to talk about, even Burkina Faso um, following the, floor, uh, the fall of uh, Blaise Compaore. Let's start with Zambia. What is that, how does that look to you now with a deeply divided country in, uh, following the death of President Michael Sata? I think Zambia now is, 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 is quite challenging as well. It's highly problematic. You have two of the main parties, the MMD um, and the Patriotic Front. Both of them have succession battles within the parties, internal battles. When you look at the Patriotic Front, obviously Guy Scott doesn't qualify um, under Zambia's constitution to run for pres the presidency. But you have two distinct parties. You've got Sampa on the one hand, and I think you have um, Lungu on the other hand, who's the defense minister. And there's a lot of in, in, um, in, in, internal battling um, within that party. And the same thing, I think, I think with, with the MMD as well where Nevers Mumba is, is heading the party, but we hear that Rupia Banda wants to come back and make a return. And so I think that does leave the situation in Zambia rather uncertain. Um, but I'm hopeful because, you know, there's always been stability in the, in the region, and I'm hopeful that despite this 
intra battles within the parties um, uh, that will see um, a free and fair election going ahead. But of course, none of them has, have, has as yet, as far as I know, um, chosen their leaders, their leaders for the presidency for, as presidential candidates. So it's still quite challenging and the situation is pretty tense at the moment. Looking at succession in Zimbabwe, we've just come out of a ZANU-PF Congress where the status quo remains the same with President Robert Mugabe at the helm. New kid on the block, of course, is his wife, Grace Mugabe. How are you looking at the projection of Zimbabwe in 2015? Uh, I'm quite concerned. I think that uh, Grace Mugabe has introduced a new dynamic to, uh, to Zimbabwe. Um, I think that uh, every, exp every indication is that when you've had a type of a dynastic succession, which is what's being tried in Zimbabwe, after a ruler that's been uh, in charge since 1980, we are headed for unstable times. I think the um, Zimbabwean uh, public uh, would not want the current regime to carry on. The, the nature of, of governance that we've seen an abuse of power corruption and patronage. I, I'm afraid that I'm, I'm quite concerned what is going to happen the day that President Mugabe is no longer able to, to, uh, uh, to run the country. And I don't think the transition to his uh, wife is going to be stable at all. She appears to be a front for uh, other elements within ZANU-PF, um, but uh, her presence is deeply, deeply resented in large portions of the country. So I'm afraid I'm quite concerned. It all depends on when that uh, instability will start, and that is inextricably linked to the to the health of uh, President Robert Mugabe. Well, thanks to my guests, Dr. Yaki Silias and Tiseke Kasambala for joining us here on Africa 360. Political stability is primary importance in fostering economic and social development and attracting foreign direct investment. When we return, we'll look at the economic trends on our continent for 2015. Do stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Africa 360. The narrative surrounding Africa's rise is a compelling one. The continent's economic performance over the past decade has been notable, reverse, reversing a pattern of low growth and instability. And joining me now to discuss the economic trends is ENCA's resident economic analyst, Clive Ramatabella-Smith, and Dr. Peter Karungu, who is a senior economics lecturer at Wits University. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining me. Now we're looking at 2015. Which are the countries to look out for in 2015 when we're talking about um, better progression in terms of economics, Clive? I, it's very difficult to say because, I mean, this pie is so massive. Mm. This continent is full of wealth and riches. And I hope that everybody will look at every country for its ability to actually contribute positively. But who but the front runners be? I'll put the front runners up there. I'll still put South Africa at number one. And I know a lot of my Nigerian friends will fight. <laughs> but yeah, I'll put South Africa at number one. I'll put Nigeria second. I'll put Kenya third. And I'll put the Ivory Coast fourth. And on the fifth, I'll put Zambia, if they can sort out their political atmosphere. So if that goes well, then those are the countries to look out for, including Madagascar at sixth. Maybe just a little bit back there, but Madagascar as well is something to look at into 2015. And which ones would be the worrying ones, sir? Well, later we are sitting on two. If you look at it, about 2011, 2012, the GDP in Africa was barely 1.6 trillion. Now it's sitting on 2.2 trillion and above. We are seeing we are seeing close to 600 billion made in a span of five years. The question is, where is the money coming from? And you can look at the statistics. The statistics is, if you look at countries like Ghana, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, you can go to Mozambique, you can go to Ethiopia, you name it. They are growing at exponential rate. So really, that's the fact. The facts are, what do we have on the table and what are people wanting to watch? And that's where the money is. And it's unfortunate that, unfortunately, my friend, the countries that are recording the lowest growth rate are in the Southern Africa. We don't know why, and those are the questions we need to respond to. Clive, your thoughts on his uh, observations? I, I totally agree with the doctor. I mean, we must be very optimistic about what's going to be taking place uh, in the next 20, 30 years, which is great because it's long term. If we're talking about 2015 and you're going to put money in Mozambique, you're going to start firstly by doing due diligences, inquiring what it is that you're actually buying into. Because these businesses or these countries that start from a lower base are very, very deep. Uh, indebted, one. Secondly, they do not have transparency protocols that you can actually follow as an investor and you can trust uh, to put your money in them. And that is the biggest challenge for these countries. They've got great potential to grow and become the massive beasts that they should be. But the question is, for 2015, will they be prepared? Will the infrastructure be there? Will there be stability? Will the financial systems actually be able to handle the kind of FDR they require for them to push forward? And the answer to that is no. And that's why you go back to the tried and tested, the likes of South Africa, the likes of Nigeria, 
secondary market, which has already seen uh, that they've actually seen the money, they've seen the cash, they've seen where to apply the monies. If you want to go long term, fantastic. Then you go for five year term and then you study these countries for the next five years. By 2015, you want to put your money where you can trust that it will be looked after. Clive, when you named your top six, you, um, you mentioned Nigeria, you yeah. mentioned Zambia. And obviously, when it comes to politics and economics, there's a strong relationship there. Mm. Nigeria goes to the polls in February. Um, Zambia, a lot of instability in terms of who's going to rule the country. That will be known after January of the 20th. Now, yeah. in terms of your projection, let's look at the Nigerian election and your thoughts on that. I think what's going to happen is that we, we I think the media sometimes just pulls things out of proportion, to be honest with you. I think the Nigerian elections will go very well. I think good luck will come back with good luck again and do what he has supposed to do. And I think if you look at what's happening in Zambia, it's, it's just a, a change of thinking that needs to be applied to the people. And I think that we've moved far too uh, uh, ahead when it comes to the African continent, when it comes to understanding politics. And I think the Zambian people will be able to understand that. This is just a periodic uh, a term and it will come to an end and then you have to vote for a new president. And they will vote and they will have a successful uh, election. So don't look at Africa and think, oh, this is going to be a terrible year because we've got these elections coming up. You look at Africa and say, look, good luck might come back if he gets the right votes, and we might see a new president in Zambia, and this will actually stabilize those countries and actually correctly bring back the FDR that they require for them to be successful. And in terms of Zimbabwe, they've just ended their ZANU-PF Congress. We know the economy there um, is not doing too well. What do we expect to see? How do we expect to see the economy in 2015? You got to look at a place like Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. and of course, it has not kicked in completely because there is a lot of, in my view, political turmoil. However, if you look at the crop that they have harvested the last one year and two years, which is indigenously driven, give credit to Radio Reform, because in the long term, and unlike probably my colleague here, I don't believe in short term. I believe in long term vision because that's the only security we have. I keep on saying to people, don't worry about today or tomorrow, worry about what is there for our generation, and then we can build the, the base for our children. Now, having said that, I don't want to narrow to say, put money in Zimbabwe, don't. If I had my money in the long term, that's a place to watch. For what reason? One, even today, despite all said and done, they have some of the brightest mites. And the economy is driven by mites. It's driven by the capability to think, to be academic, to work hard, and to have a political discourse that guides you to get that way. Of course, they don't have it for the time being. Mm -hmm. But the day they will have it, it will be a shining place. Let's talk about um, one of Africa's main trading partners, China, mm. um, in terms of investments in 2015. How do you view that? No, I think there's going to be more money. I mean, uh, President Zuma is there, and they're traveling around the African continent. They're looking for opportunities everywhere. They're studying their banks uh, in the likes of Kenya. So these guys have got a very good strategic plan of how to actually spread their wings. And in actual fact, they've shied away a little bit, actually, from the West, and they've focused on Africa. And and like the doc says, I mean, what's there not to like about the African continent when it's growing at the GDP numbers that we see each country growing at? You want to have opportunity there, but you have to gr have actually have a strong base for where you're going to be building. You understand? So if they can come back here, they do what they can be doing, despite the fact that natural fact, when it comes to numbers, you can see them actually, their GDP is just slightly declining. But next year, they might just decline even further. They might just hit 6.5. But which of the developed markets are hitting 6.5 growth? Not even America. So the answer to that is, yes, China is going to develop some more in Africa, and I'd love to see what else they've got for us. But let's not compromise too much, because even in our continent, there's things that we can do. I always speak about this, Kwangui, about the intercontinental uh, relationship or inter-country uh, relationship that we should have within the African continent to grow ourselves and strengthen ourselves better. But with foreign direct investment that China is doing, I think that is critical for our growth into 2015. Doc, apart from China, anyone else do you think will be um, giving us foreign direct investment on the continent? I think the appetite for Africa is palpating. Mm -hmm. And I'm very keen to say that I don't think American or anybody else would want to watch a country with the projection we are giving you. Mm -hmm. So I have a feeling that our old friends, maybe they will reform a little bit because they are, if they reform, they are very good people reform to Reform in with. terms of? Reform attitude, a, a little bit of arrogance, of course. <laughs> but the truth is that we are seeing a very high appetite for African investment. I don't think China is a solution. Listen to this. The highest export from China to the United States is education. In other words, Chinese spend about 300 billion, almost the GDP of South Africa, to educate their children in China. Now, 
We may divert facts so much and run away from the British and say they're going to invest that. And I come from a, a school of thought that says, don't worry about now or yesterday. That's already gone. Today's already gone. Tomorrow is here. Worry about our children in years to come and prepare them to face the challenge that the world do offer then. But you cannot run away from education. You cannot run away from being pragmatic in what we call democratic pluralization. You cannot run away from that. You can run a country which is literally, in my view, not as liberal as we think in political context. Respect for human rights is quest questionable. And we are also dealing with them and then we are friends. That could take us a little bit back. We don't know. I'm not saying don't take China for what it is, but I'm also saying I think our traditional friends are coming back, and to me, they offer a better option. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode of Africa 360. As always, we welcome your views and suggestions on topics you would like us to cover. You can join the debate by going to our Facebook page or you tweet us your views at Africa360 underscore ENCA. You can also send us an email to africa360 at enca.com. For now, it's goodbye. Thanks for watching.